Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next forum, Corporate Social Responsibility, a look behind the scenes. I'd like to welcome Margie Blinds today as our presenter. Margie is the founder and principal at Inspired Connections, LLC, and she serves as the senior consultant with Taproot Foundation. As a consultant, Margie has worked with a large portfolio of companies and their in-house CSR teams to design programs and initiatives that build nonprofit infrastructure, improve employee engagement, and provide meaningful connections between nonprofits and corporate partners. With a specific focus on pro bono programming, Margie has coached both nonprofits and corporations on how to foster mutually beneficial partnerships that meet corporate interests and nonprofit goals and direct resources to where they're needed most. With more than 15 years of experience in the nonprofit sector, Margie's worked at the intersection of people and change for um, Hands On Ohio, formerly First Link, and the Point of Light organization um, and the strategic cult, uh, consulting firm, Common Impact. She's a frequent trainer and presenter. Before we jump in today, I wanna to give a few housekeeping tips. This webinar is being recorded. We also have the option for closed captioning, which you can find in the black bar at the bottom of your screen. If you click um, live transcription, show subtitles. If you wanna change the size of your subtitles, you can go into subtitle settings and change the size, size using the sliding bar. You can also move the transcripts around your screen by clicking and dragging wherever works best for you. I want to explain the Q&A box versus the chat box. If you have questions for Margie about her content in the presentation, please put those in the Q&A box. Keep an eye on that box throughout the presentation. And if you see questions that other folks have asked that are of interest to you, you can upvote those questions so that we know those are a priority during the Q&A section. If you have issues with technical difficulties, such as closed captioning or volume, you can put those in the chat box and we will be monitoring those um, for issues. I want you to know that this recording will be available to you after this forum is completed with the email that you use to register for this event in Eventbrite. So keep an eye out for that email. The slides will be uh, sent to you there as well as additional resources provided to us graciously by Margie and also a survey uh, that helps us know whether we're meeting your needs with the nonprofit forums. So please do keep an eye out on your inbox after this is over and complete that survey so that we can make sure we're doing our best work here. And with that, I am delighted to turn this over to Margie. Um, thanks so much. Um, it is such a treat to be here with all of you. I'm just want to confirm, Danielle, that you're that everybody is seeing uh, seeing my screen and hearing me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks so much. It's always nice to just confirm you're not speaking into the void. So wonderful. Thank you for that great introduction. Uh, just a little bit of information about myself. I um, again, more than 15 years in the in the nonprofit sector. I've had the immense privilege and opportunity to really work very closely with companies and nonprofits. And I like to say that I um, have the opportunity to really work at the center of business purpose, or I'm sorry, business goals and social purpose. So just a little bit about some of the um, companies that I have worked with and uh, previously and continue to, to work with through some of my consulting um, opportunities are, include JPMC, Philadelphia Life Insurance, Fidelity, John Hancock, Charles Schwab, Amazon Robotics, which was not, uh, had an, did not have anything to do with robots. I was disappointed to learn that. Um, at any rate, uh, my experience related to corporate social responsibility is pretty broad. I am personally very passionate about pro bono and skills-based volunteering. And so if you ever, um, if you ever have an opportunity, um, to allow me to chat your ear off. I can go on and on and on about, about that. Um, and it really aligns very nicely, of course, with um, this topic. But we're really going to talk much more broadly um, on, on CSR. So you'll hear me use that term CSR 
to mean really a corporate social responsibility. We're going to further define that, but I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't um, kind of talking in too much in, inside language or uh, kind of um, too many acronyms so off the bat. So you'll notice here that um, we've got kind of an upside down funnel or upside down pyramid. And so I wanted us to really visualize what, uh, what our approach is to the topic today. And as Danielle and I uh, were really diving into and discussing what would be most relevant and helpful for you all as, as our nonprofit participants is to just lay a quick foundation of you know, what is CSR, what are coming, some of the key trends we're seeing? What's the theory behind it? And then really quickly move more into some tactical recommendations and ideas. And so you'll kind of see that we really want to kind of narrow that information down into, well, what does that mean to me? Um, Danielle shared that I'm a, a frequent uh, presenter and trainer. I'm also a frequent attender of um, training sessions, forums, and uh, conferences, and, and, and all of the like. Personally, I love really digging into the theory and uh, things like that, but I would find myself walking away and feeling like, well, I, I learned a lot, but I'm just not sure that, that it felt very actionable. And so I get a, a, I have a better understanding of the strategic vision of all of these pieces, but what does that mean for me and my organization? And so the goal today is that you really walk away with with some, some steps, some tactics, some nuggets that will really help you to take some steps uh, towards meaningful corporate partnerships. So we'll talk about things like what like technologies and processes and needs and goals that our corporate partners have, and then how we can recognize those and align our own goals and needs um, for a mutually beneficial uh, partnership that has the opportunity to be sustainable, long lasting and, um, and deep uh, and, and aligned. So quick, very on a very quick high level, I always love sharing this, it's a huge number. So according to the Center for Effective Philanthropy, each year companies give nearly $25 billion and that's dollars in charitable donations. So most of these investments are made through formal corporate social responsibility programs. CSR, very simple definition, um, is Boston Center for Corporate Citizenship defines it as how a company exercises its rights, its responsibilities, its obligations, and its privileges within society. And why do they do this? Why would a company engage in CSR? First and foremost, a community impact. It's an opportunity to, to make the world a better place. Um, I know over the past you know, 18 months to, to, gosh, going on two years now, it seems like you know, we've all, it, with, with companies of um, doing the same, but we've all had an opportunity to really kind of have a, a personal reckoning with um, you know, systemic challenges and how you know, we exist within them, how we as, as individuals may contribute to these. And we're seeing in real time, a lot of companies reckoning with this as well. I think there tends to be kind of in, um, out there in the world, uh, there can be a really negative perception of well, companies should do this or they should be better. And I'm certainly not here to paint a completely rosy, perfect picture, but I will tell you that in my many years of working with companies, I, ha I have worked with some of the kindest, most caring, and um, community-minded uh, people that I've ha ever had the opportunity to meet. And so I don't think that it really does any of us any good to not, or, or to, um, to really buy into a lot of that kind of negative um, uh, mentality around the fact that uh, what we might hear about companies. Um, we, we know that, that they really do have a, a strong uh, motivation to really make a community impact and, and, and want to do good. It also behooves companies truly to improve the quality of life in communities where they do business. It creates more consumers, it creates a stronger labor pool, and it, um, it, it creates just a stronger economy. There also, of course, are, are other motivations. So brand, brand image and perception. So as consumers, 
employees and shareholders have gotten more sophisticated just in their knowledge of company practices, it's important Com companies want to be seen as good stewards, good corporate uh, citizens. And so part of their strategy will also include in storytelling and informing of the good works that they're doing. And then employee engagement, I think this is always just such an interesting one because we see um, kind of millennials and Gen Z really leading the charge here and, um, and moving us in, in a really interesting and exciting direction. We will use the term employee engagement, and that doesn't just relate to engaging employees in volunteerism. From a, a purely HR perspective, employee engagement really encompasses kind of how happy, how motivated uh, are our employees? How likely are they to recommend us as a good place to work? How likely are we to retain our employees? And how, how fulfilled and happy in their job functions do our employees feel? And CSR is a, uh, relates very, very closely with that. You'll see here, and I'm sure we've all come across studies that highlight um, how much millennials are focusing on social purpose as part of their job or working for companies that are doing good or have strong CSR uh, policies and activities. And then talent development. Of course, with, with the biggest gains being seen in pro bono or skills-based volunteering, where we might see things like a technologist building a new website or a, finance, or a data team kind of developing a data strategy uh, for a new nonprofit. Really, any volunteering does help for employees to stretch their skills, to upskill, to step into leadership roles, and to be exposed to new issues and environments. And so volunteering in any form really does help with talent development as well, which of course is another uh, business goal uh, for many companies. As promised, I will not do a deep dive into the history of CSR. Um, I, I, I love to chat about it. So if you ever catch me offline, we can, we can do a deep dive. But I do like to just present this information to just recognize both how far we've come so from the mid, mid 1800s to early uh, 1900s, we really started with kind of the George Peabody's and Andrew Carnegie and, and uh, the Rockefellers followed with the kind of inventing that or, or, or being the leaders of the concept of philanthropy or giving back. And I do wanna recognize just the strong role that uh, a local uh, organization has played with the Cleveland Community Foundation being the very first one um, in the US and community foundations, as we know, continue to play such a strong role, both in philanthropy and in the corporate social responsibility space, with many of them housing um, employees, or I'm sorry, uh, community service councils and engaging with corporate foundations in really innovative, innovative and exciting ways. We really started to formalize corporate social responsibility and strategy more in the 70s and 80s as books were published um, and there just was more of a recognition of the necessity uh, and, the, and the positive kind of outcomes that, that can, that can uh, take place as part of CSR. And then really where we are here is we're, and, and I'm sure that we've all as nonprofits and beneficiaries of corporate social responsibility have started to see the increased focus on outcomes. And so what are the outputs? What's the impact? How are we making a difference or moving, in, or moving the needle on both social issues and the strength of your organization, as well as some of our in, internal targets that we, just, um, that we just addressed. And I personally think it's just a really neat and exciting time um, to be in the CSR space as we are to see how, again, companies are reckoning with and, and understanding kind of um, things like the inequalities that, that we all are, are aware of and what is their role and how can they be a force for good? These aren't easy questions that they're wrestling with. And it's, um, it, it's a really, really neat thing to, to kind of take a step back and really watch how some of these companies are, um, are addressing some of those things. We're gonna talk a bit more, uh, again, a bit more tactically about CSR programs. And we wanna think about it really in three main pillars. I'm certainly simplifying here what is a really complex and interesting topic, 
but, but want to make sure that we're really bringing it down into that tactical level. And so we'll think about this in kind of three different categories, giving, right? Um, funding, <laughs> grant dollars, typically through a foundation, um, employee giving dollar for doers. There's lots of different avenues and initiatives that companies have for giving funding. In-kind donations are, are also a, a big priority for, uh, for companies when we think about donation of technology. Um, some companies consider the donation of technical expertise to, to also be in-kind, but really we think about that as kind of the bucket of, of giving. Uh, volunteering, of course, many companies, and this is an, an increasingly growing element of corporate social responsibility. Really, we started again kind of with in, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, with really just being about giving money, okay? So, hey, you know, our business is doing well, and so we want to give back through just giving money. And then the recognition came that, hey, employees have causes and activities that they're passionate about. And so can we align those uh, and incorporate that as part of their employee experience to help them to, again, feel more job satisfaction and, and feel a social purpose as part of their journey as an employee for our company. Um, and there are also obviously other targets. We know that volunteering is a fun experience. It can be team building, it can build morale. Um, it can, uh, you know, those days of service can really uh, be very helpful for also internal goals as well. The third bucket, which I touched on a bit, and again, I'm not gonna dive into, but it is a growing and, a, and I think an exciting um, and interesting thing for all of us to kind of keep an eye on is around those ethical business practices. So responsible supply chain management, value-based uh, partnerships. So we're seeing some companies be very intentional about who they will work with and who they will not work with. And so all of that, we're, all of that is happening kind of in real time and is part of a CSR strategy. We're seeing a huge push, a huge boom really towards environmentally friendly processes. And in fact, we'll see this um, is also another kind of trend to keep an eye on more and more CSR personnel or CSR teams internal to companies are hiring on environmental or, sus or, sustain or sustainability as subject matter expertise. And so they're wanting to have that expertise in-house and they're wanting their CSR activities to align um, with their sustainability practices as well. And, and we touched very briefly on kind of the awareness of impact um, on inequalities. And I um, have to say, we, we, we have just so many amazing here in, in Ohio and in Central Ohio um, experts that are just really leading the charge in, in uh, helping companies uh, to, to understand it and address some of those things internally. We're going to focus more today on kind of that giving of resources and volunteering, what it looks like internal to companies, and how we can make those deep connections. I'm not able to, to monitor the chat too much while we go. Um, I'm gonna pause Danielle and see if we do have any questions or if there's anything that I should uh, kind of touch back on. Thanks for that, Margie. Um, we had one specific question about whether it was possible for you to make the slides any bigger. Um, slightly, I can do that. Um, I'm on full screen, so I think that's might be kind of the best that I could do. Are you seeing it okay? Yes, I am, and I want to make sure that folks know that you'll also get a copy of the slides after this is over, so um, you can take some more time and really dive into the reading there. Thanks for that. Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about how, so in, in order for us to really make or to develop those deep partnerships, just like we would do with any kind of kind of general stewarding or relationship building, we want to do our research. I in, in my research, I found I, I loved this statistic. In 2019, nearly 90% of our Fortune 500 companies published a CSR report. In some industries, it is required, um, but this was actually mostly optional. And so companies felt compelled and I think pretty proud of the impacts that they made. And so wanted to, so created formal reports to 
highlight, here's what we did this year, not just around how many, how much, how many products we sold and, and our sales records and things like that, but here are, here is the way that we were responsible corporate citizens and that we improved the communities in which our employees live and work. In lieu of a formal report, most companies do publish information related to their community investment on their website. And so that should be stop one when we think about um, you know, the tactics that we take to um, explore corporate partnerships and uh, as we're gonna reach out to corporate partners as well. So the info that is shared on their website or their CSR report will include, it outlines the causes and the issues on which the company focuses. Many companies come right out and say, we're focused on hunger and disaster relief. Great, that's really helpful information. So if, if our mission aligns with that, then let's pass go and let's keep exploring. If our mission doesn't align with that, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is not the possibility for a partnership, but it is likely for us to recognize fairly early on, we may not get to the status of kind of deep, sustained strategic partner. Perhaps we wouldn't be eligible for funding down the road, or we might not be eligible for certain days of service but there still might be an opportunity for us to align and partner. But then those are also decisions that we as resource strapped nonprofits will wanna think about. As we are thinking about and uh, strategizing about the corporate partners with which we want to focus and highlight and steward, we want, it, it makes sense, it behooves us to think about that from an efficiency standpoint and go out or approach the companies that we feel are most aligned or most excited about our particular mission. Even if they don't come out and say, hey, we're focused on children and youth and, uh, you know, and education, take a look at who they funded, right? Most reports, most websites will kind of give that snapshot. Here's the top 10 organizations that we funded. See what they have in common. It's likely a similar focus or mission area. And so that can also give you a glimpse into that. It will also tell you a bit about their scale and impact. So I read the other day on the Nationwide Foundation website that their largest gift ever was a $50 million grant to build Nationwide Children's Hospital. All right, so that tells me there's the ceiling, right? So I'm not gonna go in and I'm not gonna ask for $51 million from Nationwide. And that's obviously a, a kind of a, an extreme example, but we can see then kind of what is their average gift size uh, what is their average kind of number of employees that they engage each year? That tells us a bit about kind of what are the resources that they're working with. And, and we, again, we can calibrate our asks and expectations accordingly. It also it will likely highlight their programming. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but things like, do they offer, uh, are they highlighting Make a Difference Day? Okay, great. That tells us Make a Difference Day is a big priority for them. Do we, can we align with that? Do we have opportunities around Make a Difference Day? Or um, I see that they have a, a high focus on, or they're, they're promoting the fact that they, do, that they tutored 2,000 children last year. We have a wonderful tutoring program, or we're thinking of launching a tutoring program. Doesn't make sense to, to discuss strategic partnership with them. And that leads nicely, I think, into the processes. Now, this isn't likely a huge focus uh, of a CSR report or a, you know, or something that companies publish, but you can get a little bit of a glimpse into their processes. If a company, for example, launched a new internal technology, they might promote that in their CSR report. Um, it's a big investment for them, and it's also just exciting information and shows that they're working, they're working to build the infrastructure of their programming. It also might highlight their communication vehicles. So mentioning kind of that um, is the, you know, mentioning that um, the CEO participated in nine projects um, tells you just, okay, how are they, how are they socializing this? How are they institutionalizing it? So just taking all of that information and using it to paint a little bit of a picture in your head of kind of how does this work? What, how does this team operate? and leading into really how do they engage in, in CSR. I, um, now I, I post this slide as a bit a tongue in cheek and um, it's a lot of text that is really a, around kind of 
you know, we, we have this concept of, and I think we all, we all see this in our work, we have this concept of, hey, you should just do this. And we've all received very well-meaning advice from, uh, from folks that maybe are not embedded or, or terribly close to our work that, hey, if we just did this, then we could solve, then, it, then um, it, everything would go perfect. And CSR professionals and CSR teams hear that as well. So they hear it from multiple levels, uh, from inside and outside the organization. There's a perception that they are, um, that they have infinite resources at their disposal and infinite processes and infrastructure but in the same way that we as nonprofits contend with some misconceptions about the realities of our work, so do CSR professionals. So if you if it behooves you, I'd love to hear from folks just in the chat window. We'll keep cruising through with the content, but just some of your favorite advice that you've uh, that you've gotten from folks that really think that they've got that silver bullet um, and give well-meaning, truly well-meaning advice that just doesn't hit the mark. So let's talk about what really some of the realities for our CSR and company partners are. Not gonna cover all of this, right? This is a lot, just something for you to kind of digest after, but just the scale of the text on this slide really shows us that just like, just like us, just like their nonprofit counterparts, companies have strategic goals related to their CSR activities. So, and those are things, again, that we can get glimpses into as part of the CSR report as part of their, their website and our initial our initial work. But they've got goals related to the number of nonprofits that they're gonna that they're gonna serve, uh, progress that they can make on critical issues. So how how much closer are we to addressing or solving hunger in central Ohio? Number of employees engaged, including the total number of hours served and uh, individual activities or events tends to be a big or priority KPI for lots, lots of CSR folks. Um, and so that's, again, gonna be another goal. So when we are crafting our approach towards our corporate partners, let's think about what some of their goals are. And let's also recognize some of the challenges that they may have internally at their, as part of their CSR. So they, they experience their own challenges just like us. And understanding those can really help us to approach our corporate partners in such a way and really kind of deepen those relationships and, and that connection and make sure that we're really, uh, excuse me, aligning well. CSR departments are typically small. Most, um, even within kind of your Fortune 100 companies are between kind of five and 10 folks. With smaller companies, your, your small to medium-sized companies um, are, uh, you know, typically staffed even uh, much smaller. So they, they feel that employee capacity crunch, not just on, on their um, own, you know, from their own plate, what's on their own plate, but also during, you know, busy times. And so recognizing, hey, it's, it's October and that's our busiest month. And so folks are really not able to pull their head up and think about volunteering at this time. And so we're not gonna really push out a lot of volunteer opportunities. So they're balancing some of, they're, they're balancing a lot of kind of just, you know, that employee capacity challenge as well. And even the perception. So, you know, they wanna make sure, CSR professionals also wanna make sure that they're not overloading employees with information. So if you think about just all of that internal information that an employee from a large company uh, might be receive, receiving related to, of course, their workload, but then employee resource groups and healthcare benefits. And we've got um, a young professionals group and we have all of these other kind of um, information to enrich your experience as an employee, volunteering and community impact being one of those. And so the CSR team is kind of contending with uh, or, or really trying to work within a lot of some of, uh, a lot of those challenges as well. There are also priority partnerships that, that we wanna think about. So most companies do have specific focus areas and, and strategic partnerships that are aligned with those. And so if, you know, we can say, we, I can highlight kind of nationwide and Nationwide Children's Hospital. That's of course a very deep, strong partnership um, that is at the leadership level. 
However, I, I hear frequently from my CSR counterparts and colleagues that they want to foster a sense of excitement and uh, just organic participation from their employee volunteers. And so they're also balancing how do we support and participate with our strategic partnerships and get our employees excited about that, but then also provide avenues and opportunities for our employees to share up some of those causes and nonprofits that they're really excited about and passionate about. And so I see that as a challenge that a lot of our CSR partners are wrestling with. And so this can be also, this can be an opportunity for us as nonprofits. So if we've got kind of a longstanding volunteer groups of volunteers, we can even ask them, hey, do you feel like you have enough information about our work to be able to share with your CSR team? By the way, who handles that internally at, at your company? Would you like some brochures to take back? Or can I email you some information um, that you can pass on? And so those, are, those are, are some ways that you, that we can help to support that focus on kind of the organic um, participation that CSR professionals are really seeking. All right, so I wanna um, spend some time on this slide really just thinking about these opportunities as potential touch points. So these are not requirements to do all of the above if you wanna partner with companies. I encourage you to think about holistically what companies are looking for along this continuum and where there is truly alignment with your nonprofit and your needs. So, um, I'm going to just do a quick, I'm going to touch on each of these, and I encourage you again to just think about where it, where it relates to you and your, and your organization. And so communication, we'll talk even a bit more about this, but the reality is, is that CSR professionals are looking for content. So they want to highlight nonprofits on their internet, in their technologies, in their newsletter, um, in meetings. And so providing, simply providing content hey, here's a couple paragraphs about who we are and what we do, and here's a link to our volunteer activities, is a great way just to kind of get your foot in the door and, and, and share some information about, about who you are and, and is likely a pretty easy lift for us as nonprofits. We've got some of that boilerplate information. Then we move to, to, to volunteering. So think about even thinking about the specifics of, you know, oh, I do you have a volunteer technology that you're utilizing? How can, we, how can we post our volunteer opportunities on that in an efficient way? Um, when, when you get to the point where you're um, engaging with groups of employee volunteers and thinking about the di diversity of volunteer opportunities. We then move into events and sponsorships. So do you have an annual gala? Um, do you do a 5K? Are there opportunities for companies to even participate um, as individuals, as volunteers, as volunteer groups? And then of course, sharing the information that you have about events and sponsorships. But as you see, you know, we, this, is, this is not a, um, a step by, this does not have to feel like a step-by-step -step concrete process, but our first ask with a, with a company really is not likely to be very successful if it's just around kind of, hey, can you sponsor our event? Let's think about having multiple touch points as we move along this continuum. So that by the time we're approaching them or, uh, for funding, by the time we're applying for grants, whether it's a project specific um, ask, whether it's through their existing formal grant channels, they already know us, we've already had multiple touch points with them. A next stage and one that is in being a, is an increasing um, priority for our corporate partners is around board service. And so they, many, many companies see this as, as an opportunity uh, for their uh, senior leadership to participate and really um, bolster those strategic partnerships. This is also a wonderful professional development and talent development opportunity for rising, uh, rising stars within companies. And so many companies as part of their CSR programming have formal boards, board matching opportunities. Now that's certainly not to say that 
you know, hey, you know, we, we just really want to get somebody from this company on our board. Think strategically about what you need. What are some of the skills, uh, perspectives, and expertise that you might, uh, that, that where there might be gaps on your board? And have conversations. Hey, we really could use somebody with some finance expertise on our board that, you know, has volunteered with us before or, or, or has some exposure to nonprofits or, gee, we really have a, such a small HR department and we could use some HR expertise on our board. And then of course you go through a, a kind of your own process around the interviewing and, and things like that. But that is a, a way that you both can meet a goal. And then that commitment to capacity building. So that's where we see kind of these institutional or strategic partnerships. And so, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a bit of an anecdote kind of right when March, 2020, right when COVID hit, uh, our, a lot of our corporate partners, just the very first thing they did was just get on the phone. Just, hey, I've got my five institutional strategic partners that, that we have really walked alongside for 10 years and I just need to see how they're doing. And so the call, you know, it wasn't around, you know, any specific opportunity. It just was, tell us where you are, tell us what you need and we'll see what resources we can bring to bear. Sometimes that's financial. In some of the situations it was, hey, you know, we got to switch all of our, we got to switch everything to virtual, right? So can you help us with that? Can you help us find a, a a, a technology to, to help support our upcoming gala. So again, it doesn't always have to be that financial ask, but that's really once, you know, uh, again, we, we get to those institutional or deep partnerships after we've really walked alongside each other uh, for multiple years. And when we think about those, those personnel, because really at the core of it, just like we are passionate, committed professionals doing our work every day, so are our counterparts in, in the CSR world. In many cases, just uh, thinking about kind of the structure, CSR is embedded in, an, in a common internal department. So human resources is very common. Communications um, is, is also another really common department that you might see uh, CSR in. With smaller companies, community involvement might just be a portion of their job. So maybe the executive assistant to the CEO is responsible to run a few charitable activities throughout the year. Uh, maybe it's the role of just one HR person and it's kind of part-time part -time of, of their role. And so knowing those things can also help you to calibrate, uh, to calibrate your ask. Uh, and taking note of the department in which the CSR personnel is embedded can give you a little bit of insight into their goals. And so if I see that, um, you know, the company that I am uh, wanting to partner with has their CSR team internal to human resources, I'm gonna talk about the talent development goals that we have available. I'm gonna talk about how our volunteer opportunities are a great team building experience and, and folks are, are uh, building morale because they've had such a good experience. So think about those things and you can kind of lead with that a bit. Um, CSR professionals, uh, it, it's really a, bit, a growing field. So we see the departments growing, but then we also see kind of the training, networking, and professionalization of the field. I've highlighted here, and along with the, the tools that you'll get uh, following the session, some of my favorite professional organizations related to corporate social responsibility. It is very insightful to look behind the scenes. You can see what their what their sessions, you know, what sessions they're promoting, what are they highlighting, what are they excited about, what are they struggling with, what are they looking forward to. And so, you know, as you're doing your research, take a peek behind the scene and, and check out some of these really fascinating organizations. All right. And then as you know, I, I wanted to, to create this list of discovery questions. One of the things that we consistently hear, you know, as we do things like corporate panels and um, ask our corporate partners to share, um, you know, how, how can we partner with you? How can nonprofits avail themselves of your resources? Uh, what we consistently hear is we get Margie, I think you might have uh, frozen. Margie, can you try turning your camera off and see if we can get your audio back?
All right. Um, it seems like we may have lost Margie um, based off an internet connection. Yes, it looks like we um, lost Margie. Give us just one second to see if we can get her back in. And if we can't, then we will close out today. Um, while we're waiting, if you could please go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A box. If we can't get those questions answered today during our forum. I know, I, somebody said exactly when she was about to spill the secret. I was sitting on the tip of my uh, chair waiting for that moment. and. Um, we lost her. But if you put your Q&A, your questions in the Q&A box, we will record all of those questions, um, get those over to her and try to um, have her answer them. We'll also try to get the um, secret that she was about to spill right before we lost her um, and send all of that out to you in writing. I truly apologize for the technical mishap, but we will do our best to get that information to you. Um, yes, absolutely, you will get a copy of the slides and you also will get a series of resources that Margie compiled expressly for this group. They seem like they're gonna be really beneficial for this conversation. So uh, keep an eye out for those. Um, thank you to the person who gave me the compliment on my artwork in the background. Um, so I'll give us a few more minutes to add questions to the Q&A box. And once that is um, all finished, we will wrap up and close up today and I'll send the answers to those questions by email. I really appreciate your patience um, with this issue. We have somebody saying, um, is it possible to ask questions after we have the opportunity? Um, so Margie's contact information will be in the slides. You're welcome to reach out to her directly. We also have, um, a Facebook group that you can join. We post these, um, these forums in the Facebook group and you can post those questions there and perhaps the um, group will be able to answer them. Um, let's see, we have a question. Oh, we got Margie back. Um, let's see. I am back. Hi, Margie. We, um, let's jump to, well, first off, you are about to spill a secret to us when we lost <laughs> <laughs> I, it was all for dramatic effect. <laughs> um, what I've given folks directions for um, is to put all their questions in the Q&A box and anything that we didn't get answered today um, for our presentation, we would get those answers out to them after the fact. So we have folks compiling their questions in the Q&A box um, and we will get those questions over to you later. Would you like to go ahead and finish up your presentation though? I would love to. Thank you so much for your flexibility. Um, I'm going to keep cruising along with my um, uh, with the secret I was going to spell before the uh, electricity flash. So great. So again, big thanks for flexibility. We frequently hear from our uh, counterparts in CSR that they get asked a lot, what what can you give me? Kind of where are the opportunities that my nonprofit can gain resources um, from your company? But very rarely are they asked about their own internal goals, processes, and systems. And so these questions here are a very important part of your discovery process. I highly encourage you to, again, do your initial research just like we would with any potential partnership. But then as we have the opportunity to have a conversation with our corporate partners, ask about their internal programs. So do you offer paid time off? Are you looking for board matching? What are some of your goals related to engagement this year? So I see that you engaged a thousand employees last year. Are you looking to deepen the engagement or are you hoping to really expand that number? And then ask about systems. How do you track engagement? How do you post volunteer opportunities? Do you use a technology? So again, um, there's additional questions here that I encourage you all to really create a list of questions around, you know, about them, show them that you're interested in understanding what their goals are. And that's where we can really see alignment. And just like they're not going to be able to meet every one of your needs, you're likely not going to be in a position to meet every one of their goals. 
but you can, uh, uh, of course, align with, with uh, hopefully as many as possible, um, as long as it's uh, mutually beneficial. And then I want to kind of touch a bit on communication. And this really is also kind of goes back to, to perception as well. A statistic that I found really enlightening recently was that seven out, seven out of 10 companies report that most or all of the employees know about their CSR programming. And only 60% of companies report that it's a frequent topic of discussion with their management. And so if you can think about kind of where, where does that CSR department sit? Is it elevated? Did they have challenges with um, getting the right information to as many people as possible? And so understanding those, what are their communication channels? How do they tell employees about their work? Another um, intern and kind of process that we're seeing is, is growing quite a lot is the internal employee resource groups. So um, companies are intentionally kind of providing uh, these opportunities for their employees to connect around certain topics and shared experiences. And many companies we are seeing are wanting to layer on volunteering or community engagement as part of that experience. So you could if your mission or activities really align with the focus of that group, they could be a natural partner. Even outside of if there's a perfect mission alignment, many times they see it as kind of a team, a, a morale or um, you know, talent development opportunity to volunteer together as a group. We've talked a little bit about technology, but I wanted to give just a really quick snapshot and a reminder that just like we use technology, like CRMs um, and, and those types of systems to manage our work, so do our, so do our CSR counterparts. And understanding the types of technology and maybe some of those main functions can really help us to be efficient and strategic partners. So knowing, for example, that uh, my corporate partner just launched Benevity, and so they're looking to have at least five or six different types of opportunities with a diversity of, um, you know, timing and skill set and things like that. Again, let's not invent a need or invent things, but if you can help to meet those needs, if you have a close alignment, that is a way that you're helping them to meet a goal as well. Just quick, you know, again, about, about software utilization. Um, just here's some, here's some ways that, that we can be focused on helping our corporate partners meet some of their goals as well. So are we sharing a variety of opportunities? Are we understanding how they utilize their technology so that we can, uh, so that we can help support that? And then also what's limiting or frustrating about their technology? And so do I need to kind of send you an Excel sheet outside of this portal? That's helpful to know so I can be set up to do that. All right, and then of course the big question. Um, all of this information I hope is, is helpful and feels actionable, but I wanted to just kind of uh, just reiterate, we recognize the fact that um, you know, we want to, de the, the developing these partnerships, uh, it, our motivation for developing these partnerships includes hopefully being the beneficiary of this programming, whether that's funding or employee time, talent and treasure. How can we become the recipients? And again and again, we hear it's all about the relationships. So when we think back to those touch points, you know, those last few were around funding and board service. The very initial ones were really about getting to know each other, right? So we're building that relationship. And so use some of the tactics that we have highlighted in this session to approach your co potential corporate partners as, um, as an opportunity to build that relationship. Increasingly, companies want to see nonprofits as partners in this work. And so kind of really level, just leveling that. So work with us, work alongside us to engage our employees in meaningful vol and volunteer experiences. We know it's good for the community, but it's also good for our company. We want to address critical community issues and you as the nonprofits are the experts. And so help us understand how we can invest in you to do that. And again, I just wanna reiterate kind of making the ask match their systems. That doesn't just mean their technology systems, but their 
um, you know, their realities? Do they allow employees to volunteer during their lunch break? Do they have internal employee resource groups? Are they a really small company that only has a total of 20 employees? And so a huge day of service would probably not be the best ask. Are they mostly, a, um, do they have job realities in which the majority of their employees really do need to be at a desk and so aren't able to leave or need to be virtual, which you know, we all know is, is an ongoing priority, um, but taking those things into account. Okay, so we recognize that we can't have you here for a day of service. Here are some ways that we might be able to, to additionally partner. That could be skills-based volunteering or, or virtual volunteering as well. So uh, again, I just wanted to, to share some additional kind of steps around it as, as we kind of see how we scaffold and layer this relationship. So really that first step is around communicating. Give them information, give them content about your mission and opportunities that you have for engagement. Hey, even if, you're, if we're not able to formally partner quite yet, here's some information that you can share in your newsletter. Content is, is typically very welcome and needed by CSR professionals. They want to provide a diversity of content and information uh, to their employees. Ask them about the format that would be most useful. Oh, so you have an internal email blast that you send out twice a month. How long um, are, are the typical snapshots for each nonprofit? What should I include? A logo, a picture, um, a link? And so even just asking those questions that if, if, they, if your CSR partners uh, think of your organization and think, gosh, they always have the information I need really quickly and easily. That is such a benefit to them. And then also to volunteering, of course, in that next step in relationship building. To the extent that you're able, share a variety of volunteer opportunities. Make a note of the format that they're going to be shared. So is it just, is it part of an email blast? Is this posted on their intranet? And calibrate the content accordingly. Where possible, again, and without creating a need, provide that diversity of opportunities. Everybody's job function, skills, and availability is different. And so CSR professionals are looking for diversity. As that relationship deepens, be honest about some of your capacity building needs. Hey, we're really excited to invest in our infrastructure in the coming years, and one of those is going to be a new technology system. Would that be appropriate for, or would that be a good fit for your formal grant opportunities that you have coming up? Or is there an opportunity for special funding? And that is not the first conversation that we're having, but as we've again walked alongside, those are some of the conversations that our, our corporate counterparts really are looking for from us. Exploring all of their funding opportunities. So uh, particularly with our larger companies, they might have a portfolio of special event, capacity building, general operating, project specific, professional development, a, a, a opportunity for diverse funding. So explore and learn about all of those. Again, you don't have to chase dollars that you don't need. We don't need to invent a need, um, but, I, but explore and find what works for you. And then also think about what are some customized ways that, that this company might be able to support us. Now that we have this deep relationship, hey, we've got some technology needs or some needs around these types of skills. A couple other final reminders, I know we're getting close to time. I mean, share your impact. So um, one of the other things, one of the secrets I'll share that CSR professionals and feedback that we've gotten is it's so frustrating when we set up an employee group to go and we kind of send them out and then we never hear back. So we don't know, you know, what was accomplished, what the impact was, if they're hoping for us to come back or how it benefited their operations. So, and, and of course that note of appreciation is, is always helpful, but it really is helpful for companies to learn about, about that impact. So ask them, hey, do you want photos? Do you need key metrics? Do you need the sign-in sheet? Do you need to know, excuse me, the number of hours? And again, I'll, I'll reiterate this because I think it is so important, particularly um, you know, as we're just recognizing the position that we feel that, or th that we're in as, as nonprofits that are uh, seeking resources and connecting with, um, with folks that have those resources. Uh, be, be authentic. Do not invent a need. We, I'm, I'm immensely guilty of it myself, um, kind of really trying to tweak um, you know, a need into an opportunity or, or a funding source. And um, it, doesn't, it doesn't result in those genuine authentic partnerships that we're looking for. 
companies really truly want to feel like they are meeting a genuine challenge or need that you have. And so that open and honest communication uh, and trust that is built up uh, by all of those multiple touch points and kind of alignment that we've covered uh, really helps us open the door for those authentic uh, communications. All right, and then a very, very simply, um, just the different kind of stages. I, I like to think of that initial outreach as part of a discovery process. So I'm gonna do my research about my corporate partner. I'm gonna learn all of those things like they're I'm gonna learn about their technology and I'm gonna review their website and their CSR report. Uh, I'm gonna ask some of those questions in our initial meeting. And so that gives me that kind of strategic, tactical, and then that individual view. And then I'm gonna look for ways that I can align my nonprofit needs with their opportunities. It's not gonna be a one-to-one -one perfect fit. There's not going to be an opportunity for, uh, for us to probably hit on every single one of their priorities. Um, but, if I, but, but let's find some ways that we can authentically and genuinely in, in a mutually beneficial way connect. And then let's, let's build that relationship. What are those additional layers that we can have? Hey, you guys have been partnering with us for five, six years now. This is great. We had a board seat open. Let's talk about that. We'd really love to have you guys represented on, on our board. Uh, or, hey, we've got this really sticky data challenge. And I know you guys have a data team. Can we develop or scope out a, a pro bono project? And it comes with that just consistent partnership and communication. Um, Danielle has a lot more of this of, uh, kind of these to share. These are included in the email that Danielle will be sending out. So you'll have access to all of these. Again, lots of great um, tools. Um, I do want to highlight the Serve Ohio SVB Toolkit, which was um, uh, created as part of an amazing partnership with Common Impact and Serve Ohio. And the toolkit, while focused on pro bono and SBV, has a corporate partnership section that does have templates and sample wording that you could use in initial outreach to nonprofits. Or I'm sorry, as nonprofits, you can use some of those templates and, and wording in your outreach to, to potential corporate partners. So it should feel pretty plug and play there. All right, and I'm going to to pause and see what questions we have. All right, um, so that leads us right into our Q&A section and we have a good bit of questions in the Q&A section. Um, let's see, this might be a risky prospect for you to um, take down your slides. Uh, will you be able to share your screen or share your um, camera or should we leave it off? Oh, yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we should be fine to do that. And then I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay. Maybe it won't be as taxing if you're not sharing your screen. Yes, I, hopefully the excitement is over. Yes. Um, so we have about five questions in the Q&A box right now. Please leave more questions if you have them. Um, we have someone that is um, writing down all of the Q&A sections because we're about halfway technically through the Q&A section portion right now. So if we do run out of time, you'll still get answers to your questions because um, we will send the answers out in the post form email as well. But let me quickly get started. Um, so our first question here is, um, what are your thoughts on how to select the best corporate organizations to reach out to? Yeah, you mean to go ahead? Yeah, yeah. I, I, this is a great question. So, um, you know, I think that if if you've got kind of a uh, a development team, this this and even if you don't, but but really, this is around kind of stewardship and and prospecting. And so, thinking back to some of those initial concepts that we talked about, is really around alignment. Like that first piece is what companies in your area or kind of within your purview are focused on your mission area. And lead with that, and so we're so that does it. It, it can be a time-intensive process to just kind of research websites. So you know who do you know who, who do these top fifteen companies fund? I've seen some nonprofits um, kind of carve this out as an intern as an intern opportunity or a volunteer opportunity, and that's helped um, just with just it. It can be resource intensive, but but it really first is around that mission alignment, and then look to see, are they in some way, we talked about the fact, not every company is going to have a CSR um, report, 
but a lot of them are going to promote their volunteer activities. So do you see in their social media on their website that they're promoting, hey, look what we did with, you know, our volunteer, or I'm sorry, our employees got out and volunteered and that was great. So that tells us, okay, this is this, they're looking for opportunities like this. If there's a community investment portion or community relations portion to their website, that's also, uh, I think, a good indicator that this is a, a company that is seeking partnership opportunities. So it's really about doing some initial research um, into those companies before we um, start building the relationship. And so that leads into another question. What does that initial relationship building look like? How do we start that process? Um, so I'm just gonna throw out cold calls. Is that the way we start the process? Um, how do we um, open that initial door? Yeah, I mean, I hate to use, this is just such a trope to, to, to kind of talk, to compare it to dating, but it a bit, it a bit is, or even, uh, you know, kind of getting a new job or, or exploring a, a new company. Um, a, a cold call, I don't recommend a cold call as an ask, but I have, we hear, I hear consistently from CSR folks, we want you to reach out to us. We want to know who you are. We don't want you to ask us for money in that initial call, but we do want, because we, again, we, we, we want to, to know more about you. And so being armed with that information uh, is very helpful. And we also recognize when we were building the SBV toolkit that the concept of reaching out to companies can feel intimidating. And so that's why we created even the, the simple kind of plug and play, um, here's some sample language that you can use. And so I think a, a, an initial call or email of introduction, hey, my name is, the organization I'm working with is, here's our mission. And I'd love to share some additional information with you about the amazing work we're doing. Initially, you are, you're reaching out to brag about how great you are. And then, um, and then we're gonna come armed and maybe that initial conversation or maybe that second date or second conversation, we're talking about, hey, we're showing, I did a bit of research on, on uh, you know, what you all accomplished last year. Tell me a little bit about you know, what that looks like. What are some of your goals for next, uh, for next year? So, so once we kind of move from that introduction phase, here, here's what I am, uh, then it's more about kind of, okay, so tell me about you, tell me. And that shows them that you're exploring the ways that you can also be a good partner. So again, I think an initial phone call or initial email with, it, with a focus on sharing information is, is really the best way. That's good to know. So we have another one that I think is a really interesting question. Um, do you find that there's a reluctance among corporations um, or even some of their employees to engage with interfaith, spiritual or religious based organizations? Yeah, this is, this is, um, thanks for this question. I, I'm going to be honest, it's a challenging one. And, and the answer is sometimes um, there, there really can be um, a, a bit of a, a bit of a reluctance. Some companies have documented policies. Most of the policies I have seen, disclaimer, this is not legal advice. Most of the policies that I've seen are related to um, it, whether or not a nonprofit would exclude a volunteer or a, or a service recipient because of uh, faith, ethnicity, um, or any other uh, protected class. And so the, vast, you know, vast majority of nonprofits that, that I have ever worked with that have a faith-based uh, foundation do not operate in a way that is discriminatory. And so if, if you're feeling that reluctance, um, you know, even leading with that, um, I was on a consulting call recently with, the, with a nonprofit that um, really promoted the faith-based element of their work. And so we just opened the dialogue and said, Hey, I see that this is a big element of your work. Can you tell me a little bit about you know, how that plays out with and how you know how, how you work with your clients, potential volunteers and supporters? And so they were able to very clearly and, and, and authentically answer this is this is the motivation for our work, um, but we do not discriminate and we, and we invite um, folks from all faith, um, you know, faiths and backgrounds to, to join us. Um, so somebody said, um, I missed what SBV stands for. Uh, that's skilled-based volunteering, correct? 
It does. And I won't even get started, Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> Skills-based volunteering is a whole nother forum that we'll have to work through, but it's a really important part of this discussion. Um, so we have another that says, if a corporate, a corporate partner becomes um, a, a corporation or a corporate partner or uh, sponsorship, do they ever include nonprofit representatives on their board, like maybe a board exchange? So we take a corporate um, employee and put them on the nonprofit board and a nonprofit employee to put on a corporate board. Is that something you've heard of before? I have never heard of that, but I love the idea. And I think as more companies are living into their DEI principles, we might see more of that. Um, where I have seen that, I again, I have not seen that in a formal way, but I have seen more companies, particularly around, you know, as I said, DEI and, and, and racial inequities, wanting to put themselves in more of a listening space and holding their nonprofits up more as subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. And I've seen nonprofit representation more informally on employee resource groups. So, hey, can you join us and work collaboratively as we develop or live in, or you know develop our DEI principles here within our company? And we and and you know you're a subject matter expert, and so can you walk alongside us? I love that concept. I just haven't seen it. Absolutely, I think that would be a spectacular addition to any corporate board. Is that um, that unique nonprofit perspective um, from our sector? That would be, a, I think, a bonus for any corporation. Mm -hmm. Anybody's out there listening? It's a great idea. Um, the next question we have is: If a board, uh, a big corporation, a big corporate contribution includes naming rights. Is that really a charitable donation? Uh, Danielle, do you want to weigh in on that? Do you have, I, um, I mean, I can't, I can't um, give insight into the legalities of it. Um, well, so I can't give insight into the legalities of that question either. Um, I think though that that has to be a discussion that you have uh, when you're building out packages for, um, your corporate asks. It is an a it's a it's a historical part of what it means to do corporate fundraising. And so um, I think it's certainly something that you should keep at the table and part of your conversations. Um, how do you negotiate naming rights um, in an ethical way with the rest of your fundraising campaign? So I would encourage you to think about it. That doesn't necessarily mean you should do it. You should think about whether that method is really something that fits um, ethically with your work. I hope that answers your question. Do you think I answered that question, Margie? I do, I do. And I, I think there, there might be an element here too of, um, you know, is there other motivations behind the gift or things like that? And, and you know, I don't know that I'm, Again, I kind of opened the the conversation today with the fact that I don't I don't really want to assign value of you know good or bad or intentions behind um, things that you know the reality is an investment into the community is helpful and beneficial um, and and there are when we think about charitable charitable uh, deductions and things like that you know um, it, as Danielle mentioned get really clear about what that means for everybody, right? If we're putting your name on a building or we are naming a signature program after you, what are the benefits, you know, what are the benefits legally ta on a tax, tax basis um, and from a marketing lens that we get and that you get? And that's okay. Like we, we don't, we don't need to shy away from entering into what might feel like more of a business partnership with our, with our corporate partners. Um, it's going to take all different kinds of partnerships to, to address some of these issues we're facing. Yeah, I would definitely encourage um, entering such a relationship with some structure that was pre-planned. So in other words, not inventing an off the wall sort of thing for a one specific relationship that you're trying to build, but being really strategic about what corporate partnerships look like for your organization um, and moving forward with that that really helps with uh, making a best match between you and the organization, as opposed to you really just building something kind of new for a one-off. Um, 
So we also have another question around um, knowing that a business uh, may value the public image of a corporate responsibility. What are some ways we can offer this publicity when approaching their uh, CSR? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I think it's really it's it's good to think about this. So um, think about what you're already doing. Okay, so do you post pictures? Do you post status updates just on social media, for example, about your your corporate partnerships already? If you're not, I I think that's a great practice. Um, so you can also highlight that. You can talk to them about, hey, here's you, here's what we typically do. Um, you can feature their um, you can feature their logo on your uh, on your website. You can feature their logo in some of your other materials like a newsletter or an email blast. You can send out a press release to say that you're very excited to be the, the recipients of XYZ Foundation support. Um, and again, you, we just we don't have to shy away from this conversation. We can also, as part of that discovery process with our corporate partners, say, hey, we're really excited to partner with you. How can we, sh what are some ways that you like to see your nonprofit partners promote your partnership? Um, and you'll hear things like, hey, we, we're big on Twitter. And so if you could post, you know, if you could tweet and, and tag us, then we will retweet. Um, I have some, you know, and, and, and asking that question really does give you a lot of insight. I've got some, you know, some corporate partners that are really big on Twitter. I'm not a Twitter person. Some that are really big on LinkedIn. And so they're really wanting to see they're wanting us to show up where they are. And so just, again, kind of let's, let's ask those questions. What has, you know, what has worked for, for you really well in the past, both from our own standpoint? Hey, here's some practices that we already have in place. And then let's, let's just ask the question authentically. Hey, how else can we promote how excited we are to partner with you? If I could just add to that, um, you know, beginning this process, Number one, before you reach out to your first corporation um, with the end in mind, how, how much can we really commit to uh, with a bandwidth uh, wise, like how much human capital do we have? How much time do we have to commit to um, what it means to market our organizations? If we can do it for one, can we do the same exact thing for mm. three or five? Um, and, and thinking through that before you engage. So you don't agree to things that you can't repeat with other organizations, you know, being really strategic about how you, um, how you do that. That helps make sure that you don't feel as though you're giving more out than you're getting back from the mm -hmm. relationship because nobody wants that either. Even our mm -hmm. corporations don't want that. It needs to be a win-win for sure. So we have another question that says, if we reach out to a corporation whose philanthropic focus is a really good fit for our mission and work and we don't hear back, how long should we wait before reaching out again? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I'd give them just kind of general professional courtesy, uh, maybe at least a week, maybe two weeks. Um, we, might, we might be uh, finding them in, in a, a particularly busy time, um, you know, just they, they might have just launched a program or, or something like that. You know, we never know. We're, we're all guilty of, of cruising past an email and meaning to, um, to, to circle back to it. So I, I would say kind of assume good intent, give them, give them a couple weeks. I'd follow up via email um, just in a really, uh, you know, kind of non-accusatory way. Just, hey, just sharing some information with you. Um, if you're not able to kind of get through via email, you can also just kind of pick up the phone and, and try to give them a call. Hey, you know, my name's, my name's Margie. I'm calling from XYZ Nonprofit. I'd love to share some information with you. What's the best way I can do that? Um, and then also, you know, I know that we don't, you, you know, we, we're typically used to now is sending things electronically, but sometimes it's nice also to, hey, can, would you like me to send something to you through the mail? Um, you know, some folks like to have things in their mail room or in there. I, I'm working with a client who just really wanted things in their lobby. Hey, we're supporting this nonprofit and we'd like to have some of their brochures in our lobby to just kind of have their brand represented there. And then also our employees can pick up that brochure and identify some ways that they can get engaged on their own. But we wouldn't have known that if we didn't ask. The other thing I'll add to that is um, when we think about employee turnover, you know, if you've asked once five years ago and didn't hear a response, um, definitely don't shy away from, from asking again. Um, maybe don't, you know, call someone every single week, but certainly if a considerable amount of time has passed and you um, 
when you've asked, try again, because maybe staff have turned over, um, maybe their priorities have shifted. Um, so that's another piece of it. Uh, we have time for one more question. So is there any difficulty in getting corporate attention if your organization has any level of government funding? My experience, um, I worked for a nonprofit that had a significant, I, I would say maybe 30% of their funding was, was government, was, you know, from public, public funds. Um, and we still would uh, kind of approach corporate partners or, or really work to find uh, corporate partnerships. I think the only, I mean, I think that the only challenge may be around the perception. So is there a perception in the community that you are entirely corporate or I'm sorry, entirely government funded? And so do you need my funding or um, are, or is a perception that you are kind of internal to a government department? Not that that's a not that that's a bad thing, but that can feel confusing around structure. Most corporations are um, are obligated to give only to five hundred one c threes. If there's confusion around, uh, you know, the type of structure that you might have, that I think that might be a perception that that you have to work to overcome. Absolutely. We actually have one more question that I'd like to get into the recordings. I think it's good. I've heard it's sometimes difficult to find the right person to talk to you at a corporate, at a company to begin a connection. Are there any suggestions on how to find the right person? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. The SPV toolkit actually does have some insights into this. It'll give you even some like recommended things to search. I would start again, Google is your friend. So review their website, um, find any name, uh, review their website, um, particularly any mention of community service activities. Um, if there's a name related to those, you, you know, th that's, that's a great starting point. Um, if there's a general, you know, I, I think as a last resort, just kind of sending email to their general, in, you know, info at company.com. You know, it feels really cold call-ish and it's probably not as successful as something more targeted, but it's a way, it's, um, it's a way in. You also might think about asking, is there anybody in your network or any employees of that company that you know? That's not to say that it's a silver bullet, but I've asked my friends before, hey, who, when, who runs your volunteering opportunities? When you get information about a volunteer opportunity that you have at Abbott, whose name is on it? Um, and so just kind of using your own, using your networks um, in that way, just to understand who's the best person that I could reach out to. In that case, I would have some specific information. So a, a kind of specific ask that feels a bit actionable. The ask is not funding, but hey, we have uh, this volunteer opportunity that we thought might be of interest to your company. And so I'm sharing this really specific information. Because if it's not somebody's really specific job function to be the community engagement person, you sharing information about how great your mission is, isn't actionable to them. So we're going to have to hold their hand just a little bit more in that instance and give them something to fight on to and chase. That was, that was very helpful. We are all out of time. Uh, we have a couple more questions in the Q&A uh, box, and so we will make sure those answers uh, get out to you in that uh, post form email. Keep an eye on your inboxes um, for that email and also for a survey. We always send a survey after all of our forums. Um, we're asking for you to complete the survey just to help us understand um, whether we're meeting your needs. It also gives you an opportunity to suggest and recommend topics for future forums. And um, we would love to have that information from you. So take a moment to fill out that survey and return it. Um, and with that, I appreciate your patience um, with, with sticking with us today. We had a few technical difficulties that we were able to negotiate, um, but thank you so much for your patience today and have a lovely rest of your week. Thank you, Margie. Oh, thank you, everybody, and, and echoing again the appreciation and the flexibility. Thanks.